Okay, I think we'll get started. We have uh, a good turnout here. Good evening, everyone. I'm Keith Crumwoody, Dean of the Architecture Division at CCA. On behalf of Autodesk and CCA Architecture, I'd like to thank you for joining us for New Horizons in Digital Craft, the second event of the CCA Architecture Spring Lecture Series. Please note that should you want to, you can enable closed captioning at the bottom of your Zoom window with the live chat button. And if you, uh, your mic is not muted, if you could mute it now, uh, I'd appreciate it. At CCA, we understand land acknowledgement as a transformative act meant to confront our place on native lands and to build mindfulness of our present participation in colonial legacies. CCA campuses are located in Wichin and Yelamu, also known as Oakland and San Francisco, respectively, on the unceded territories of Chichenyo and Ramatu Shaloni peoples, who have continuously lived upon this land since time immemorial. We recognize the historic discrimination and violence inflicted upon indigenous peoples in California and the Americas, and the deliberate and systematic destruction of their communities and culture. CCA honors indigenous peoples, past, present, and future here and around the world, and we wish to pay respect to local elders, including those of the lands from which you're joining us virtually today. As I said before, we're gathered at Autodesk San Francisco Technology Center on Pier 9 for tonight's event, New Horizons in Digital Craft. I'd like to thank everyone here for hosting us and for making the event possible, especially Gabby Patton. Tonight's event marks an important milestone in the academic alliance launched last year between CCA Architecture and Autodesk Technology Centers, as we welcome Roxandra Kujda and Guru Tise from the Center for Information Technology and Architecture in Copenhagen to San Francisco as the inaugural academic alliance researchers and residents. During their time at CCA, Roxandra and Guru will be working here at the Technology Center and sharing their work and leading a seminar and workshop with students in the architecture division at CCA alongside some of our faculty. I'd like to thank Margaret Ikeda and Nagar Kalantar of our faculty for initiating the conversation that started the Alliance and for keeping it moving these past two years. I'd also like to thank Dustin Smith and Jessica McMillan of CCA and Rick Rendell, Athena Moore, Yuri Cataldo and everyone at Autodesk for their commitment to the project and their dedication to making it all happen. I'm thrilled to be moving forward with this exciting initiative and to have the opportunity tonight to share it with all of you. Now I'd like to introduce, introduce tonight's moderator, Key Schmidt. Key is a two, 2023 MR candidate at CCA, and as of the fall of 2021, an Autodesk Technology Center resident. They earned a Bachelor of Arts at the Evergreen State College with an emphasis in art history and practical craft. And before coming to CCA, they worked as a steel fabricator for several years and are currently a designer fabricator for SF-based firm, Future Forms. It's all yours, Key. Hi, um, thanks everybody. Um, I, I just wanted to share um, some of the work that I've been doing here um, at Autodesk. Um, can you see my screen? Um, so as Keith said, my name is Keith Schmidt and I'm an MARC student and resident here at Autodesk. Um, and I first became involved at the Technology Center through my research work um, with CCA Associate Professor and Co-Director of the DCL, Nagar Kalantar. Uh, we worked together over this fall semester on a research project developing three-dimensional complex, complex structures we call 3D curfing. In two-dimensional space, curfing is the process of cutting deliberately to create flexibility within rigid material. Our research engaged with the generating of three-dimensional structures that perform multi-directional flexibility made from rigid materials. These complex structures are 3D printed flat and then transform into flexible 3D forms. We are interested in how the geometry can be controlled to create desired flexibility and rigidity on demand, rather than man manipulating the material itself. By working with, explicitly with the geometry, architects and designers can transform and engage with materials in a hand-to-hand -hand or mesoscale rather than at a molecular level that of material scientists. Our next steps in research are to generate flat digitally fabricated specimens which lock in desired three-dimensional forms. And um, I personally like to thank Autodesk and CCA for giving me the opportunity to engage so directly with digital craft. And um, I'm looking forward to the presentations and the discussions later. 
Um, so first off, we have um, Jason Kelly Johnson, who is a tenured associate professor at California College of the Arts in San Francisco, and he teaches in the architecture program and is co-director of CCA's Digital Craft Lab, along with Nagar Kalantar. Jason is founding design partner of Future Forms, an award-winning experimental design and research office based in San Francisco, California. I'll take it away. Great, thank you, Key. And it's um, fascinating to see your, your research at Autodesk. Um, and I also wanna thank Autodesk and thank CCA and, and thank everyone who um, um, has put this together. And of course, our visitors from CETA who we'll hear from very shortly. Um, everyone sort of, it seems like has overcome all of the, all of the odds to um, converge and to, to make this um, exciting um, event um, happen. Um, so yeah, my name is Jason Kelly Johnson. Um, I'm the co-founder and co-director of the CCA Digital Craft Lab. And I'll go ahead and share my screen. Um, and as was mentioned, I'm also um, the um, design principal and co-founder of Future Forms. And I'm not really gonna focus on that work tonight. I'll really just focus on the work of the Digital Craft Lab um, really in the last um, nine or 10 years. And, um, and just, just trust me and rest assured that the, the work of the, of the lab for sure has um, fed into my, my, my practice at Future Forms in, in lots of, of ways. Um, so as a way of an introduction, the Digital Craft Lab um, was was founded roughly 10 years ago by Andrew Cudless and myself um, as a place to begin to bring um, sort of research projects into um, into the school. Um, CCA, you know, started as a as an art and design school um, and is now firmly a kind of um, architectural environment, and we've all been trying to understand how we might move um, from a R1 research environment. Um, myself and my partner Natalie and, and also Andrew Cudless also you know came from R1 research institutes to, to come to CCA. Um, so in a way, this was a way to not reproduce at all what was happening at an R1 institutional, um, but to maybe blend some ideas. So advanced computation, but also um, some of the experimentation and playfulness um, that comes with being in an art. Um, in design environment in the in the city of, of San Francisco, um, lots of different things that I'll that I'll talk about. We have lots of events and and lots of partnerships and lots of things happening. We also have this totally awesome um, MAAD um, um, program um, that is a one year advanced architecture master's degree. Um, we also have a design concentration in digital craft um, for the for our BRC students um, and our MRC students. Um, these are the topics um, that we're sort of um, getting into. And so it's a pretty exciting um, place. The sort of core um, sort of leadership um, currently as myself as co-director uh, with Nagar Kalantar, who happens to be on sabbatical right now. And she's also um, very much involved with the Autodesk um, um, Pier 9 and, and all of the activities that have been kind of happening here. Um, and, and Adam Marcus as a research lead who crosses over between um, several labs, but um, generally has been at the core of the, of the research. Um, the work of Nagar, I think, um, as Key alluded to, I think is really profoundly, um, um, well, it's incredibly interesting and I'm, I'm, I'm loving that um, our, you know, that, that the work of Nagar um, is pushing the boundaries um, and pushing, you know, the lab to begin to think about new materials and new new protocols. And she's very much interested in, um, you know, um, 3D printing as a means to explore um, new form finding, new new manufacturing kind of processes. These are just a snippet of some of the slides. She's also been um, working with Autodesk um, and the Technology Center um, over the years to produce some really incredible work. Um, if she wasn't on sabbatical, she would she would she would be here uh, co-presenting. Um, Adam Marcus, um, and you'll see more of this work um, tonight, um, has also I think really pushed the boundaries of, of digital craft 
um, over the years and his collaborations um, with various um, people in the San Francisco Bay Area nationally, um, especially with this Buoyant Ecologies project, which is a, a float lab just off of uh, um, Oakland. You can see San Francisco in the distance, um, working with partners like Chrysler and others um, to um, bring all of this digital craft um, um, and test it in the environment and have a kind of ecological sort of ethos um, that's uh, really under, underlying the work. So it's been really, um, you know, fascinating. And, and some of um, Adam's most recent work in his ecological tectonics um, um, work um, is looking at um, 3D printing clay um, vessels for, um, for um, I think, uh, um, habitats um, for birds and other um, seaside habitats and using um, clay printing in the digital craft lab. Um, the, the Digital Craft Lab does a lot of different things, um, and over the years, it really did start as a kind of testing ground. Um, I don't think Andrew and I really knew what this was going to turn out to be. We, we would hold um, really large workshop events, um, invite a lot of different people in. People would fly from, you know, fly from all over the country to do these things. This is the nave at CCA, which is this sort of magical um, space to kind of mix it up. Um, we do a lot of stuff in public. We bring professionals in from all over the world um, to, to work with us, work with our students, and to make the work, um, you know, kind of public. Um, and this is a typical, of, a typical um, event. It's very different than other schools where you might go to a final review in, a, in, a, in an architecture school or an art school where it's all kind of cloistered up in a private room and it just seems like it's a, it's a club or something. CCA is the opposite. Um, it's an open environment. Um, you could literally walk in off the street if you're vaccinated, I suppose, um, and attend these um, events, um, comment on them, talk to the students, talk to the assembled experts. It's a very unique um, um, environment, also in a very unique you know, building that supports that, that kind of work. We do lots of public events over the years, and we're really thankful to Autodesk and other partners like the Museum of Craft and Design uh, who supported these um, these events, sometimes they're on the main lecture series, other times they've just been sort of sideline, side series that bring in people in an informal way. Um, we, we've hosted a, a number of these over the years that have been really exciting. Um, this weekend um, on Saturday, we're hosting um, another workshop um, on metal skins with our partners, um, Ruxandra and Guru from, from CETA um, called Metal Skins, Non-Standard Fabrication methods for curved surfaces. They'll talk about that research tonight, but it's just so exciting to, to have them as our first um, public, public workshop or event in the last two years during COVID. So it's exciting that we're, we're doing this um, at CCA on Saturday, fully masked, of course, but um, and safely as possible. But um, for us, it's exciting to sort of open things back up. Um, the Digital Craft Lab has always been about experimenting experimentation, experimental software, hardware, and material workflows. Um, we really kind of link it up. I love this image taken in the Digital Craft Lab of these various activities kind of coming together. So you can see a laptop running code and, and experimenting in 3D modeling and programming environments. Um, you can see a, a Delta bot um, made by the students. So all of the students are in this period were making their own machines. And also they were um, creating their own um, clay um, pastes to do 3D printing. This is six years ago um, um, up in the lab. So you can kind of see the craziness of, of that environment. One of the underlying um, things that I think, you know, um, that we, you know, really try and get the students to embrace failure. Um, and it's pretty uncommon, let's say, in someone's training that you would give high fives to somebody, one of your students say, when, it, when things explode or fail or 3D prints burp all over the floor or things do really you know, unexpected things, but we really embrace failure and, and the idea of an unknown out outcome is, is really at the core of that. Um, we'd like to shift conversations from, my, from conversations that are about efficiency or precision um, to ideas about exploration and iteration. Um, there's no there isn't necessarily a right or wrong way to do things. You can see various um, students all in our, our, uh, our one year MAD program here um, experimenting with, with ba basically making 3D printers themselves and also then experimenting with new ways that we could use 3D printing to sort of upend 
the way that they're currently being used. Um, the idea is to also expand um, the material palette to look at, you know, um, ecologically sound materials, um, things that are biodegradable, of course, and we look at the full lifespan. And so you can see students here actually 3D printing, um, making configurations out of, of rice and other other things to try and understand what the what the ideas are, you know, sort of behind them. Um, we also embrace this idea of fast, cheap, and out of control. Um, these are these are large scale concrete prints. This is from about um, seven years ago. Um, built we built a machine that was printing pretty large stuff, um, and the students were not only building the machine; they were actually custom building the code. And then we always require them to do a kind of performance at the end of this so that that you actually can see this in the public and you can see all of the complexities and, and sort of celebrate this fast, cheap and out of control. Another idea is to work together to intensively explore and expand thinking through collaboration. So none of these students and none of the folks gathered really know what they're doing. They're sort of amateurs and they're 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 week after week collecting knowledge and sharing it and building up. Um, complexity and and uh, and the results are quite quite exciting. Um, this is quite late at night, about midnight, um, experimenting with an unknown territory. Students are really asked to sort of jump off the cliff and see what will happen. Um, and oftentimes it's frustrating and oftentimes it's it's exciting when, when small things work. Um, we ask the students to believe in the value of rigorous research and process driven design. And uh, just smile and act like you know what you're doing. Um, at the final reviews, um, these are collected people from all over the place, architectural experts, experts from Google, experts from robotics companies. We bring them in and get the students in conversation with them. Um, and, and there's some really unexpected conversations that start to happen. We also share. Um, this, is the, this is that project you just saw. We asked the students to share on, on Instructables I mean, in other places, you can see that this particular project has been viewed close to 50,000 times um, and downloaded and emulated and copied and, and improved upon and evolved. Um, designers can be mad scientists too. So um, I think a lot of folks that start in the program really want to understand things you know, under the hood and want to get deep and um, don't want to be told you know, that they shouldn't do something or something is wrong. They want to actually, there's a lot of trial by error. Um, I, we, I often ask the students to have fun with the perverse uncertainty of the world to come. We know that the world is changing. We know that climate change is real. We know that we're dealing with you know, massive uncertainties about the future. And so I think those massive uncertainties require um, new ways of thinking um, about the world. And the students are, are asked to sort of experiment within that. This is the Swarmscapers remote, uh, basically a remote um, 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 robotic 3D printer that basically goes through and collects um, and, and deposits um, in real time. So it's not a fixed gantry 3D printer. It's something that's actually moving in, in real time. This is about six years old research um, with computer vision and, and other things. The robots are, are autonomous agents. Um, the other thing that's encouraging is to get students to embrace their interests in things that are pressing issues that are facing humanity. So this is a, an algae 3D printer um, that would get dropped into, um, into sites with drones and would remediate sites, um, bioremediate sites. Make the, the next point here is to make the assembled group of experts nervous, but also excited. So these are people that are coming from the tech world, Silicon Valley, that have it all figured out. And then they come to CCA and they're like, what in the world have these people done? And this is absolutely beautiful. Um, and so the unexpected results, I think, are, um, are what we're after. And I ask the students, take it serious, have pride in your work and discoveries and don't apologize for the work. Explain, display, and celebrate the process. Um, bring the laboratory, be prepared to bring all this into the real world, present it publicly, um, be open to interrogation, but also be, be open to questioning and, and celebration and expansion of, of thinking. Making it performative is also really critical. We ask the students to, to put this out there and see what happens. We also embrace the idea of tiny experiments. We, don't, we, we, we have to start somewhere. 
um, the smallest experiments you hold in your hand, and then they, they build up from there. Um, and don't be afraid to start small. Small intricate parts gathered together to explore bigger ideas and students are ambitious. They're building units and modules. Digital craft can be explored using material. Digital craft can also mean light. It can be about light and shadow and other um, elements in the world, other atmospheres. These are 3D prints um, from a from $150 3D printer, by the way. Um, this, is not, um, this is not an expensive system. Um, it is really just the, the work goes into the coding and the software side of it. And these prints are all less than 10 minute prints that collect together. Um, put it out in the world, put it in the public and the sun and the wind and study your work. Let it get blown over. Let a little kid run under, underneath it um, and, and try and understand how the work will have an impact on the, on the environment. Blurring the distinctions between the digital and the physical becomes really important. And I think that's, it's, a, it's a possibility that, that those distinctions will certainly be gone in, 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 in the very near future. So a lot of us is, is, is actually projecting these um, ideas on the environment. These are experiments with using digital projectors. We've been working in the Digital Craft Lab to bring some of these ideas um, out into the physical world. Here we are projecting onto objects. We're building things in weird places like underpasses. We're experimenting with bringing the public in to try and understand you know, how people react to them how they act can activate spaces. Um, we throw parties, but we also study the reactions of people. Um, we try and amplify these ideas to the full scale. The Digital Craft Lab right now, after two of a sort of a two year hiatus, um, we are actively experimenting with um, six axis um, industrial robots and trying to understand how to use them in creative ways. This is a KUKA robot. This is just taken last week. These are our incoming students. Um, trying to bring the code from the computer out in the real world using the industrial arm. Um, and then this is a really beautiful moment where, where Winky's praying that it's going to be incredible. And of course it is. And she's very proud of the, the drawing. Coming soon, the new CCA Digital Craft Lab at Double Ground. We are um, shifting the space. We're building a new building. Um, we'll have an amazing new, new building. Um, it'll be something like three times the size of our current space. We're gonna have multiple robots, robotic cells, multiple spaces to work. The students will actually have desks right in the lab, 3D printers, exhibition space on an outdoor courtyard, right beside the, the digital prototyping lab, the CNC mill and all of that on an outdoor courtyard. Um, it's gonna be here where that red arrow is. Um, so I'd say the future of the digital craft lab and the new horizons, of the digital craft lab are, are very um, optimistic. Um, I'm gonna end it there. Thank you so much. Thanks, Jason. Um, so next up we have uh, Angie Voss, um, who is an innovative development manager for the Autodesk Technology Centers and um, is based in San Francisco. Angie has a background in computer engineering and began her career as a video game developer. She then went on to work in higher education for over 15 years. She now continues her work supporting innovative innovation across industries. Thanks, Key. Um, can you guys hear me okay? Uh, thumbs up maybe, yeah, all right. And I'm gonna share my screen. Um, hold, give me one second. Let's see if this, this works. Um, can you see my screen? Yep, awesome. All right, well, thank you, Key. Um, Jason, I'm ready to sign up for uh, the Digital Craft Lab. I'm very excited, that was awesome. Uh, the students must be uh, so so lucky and so happy to be in that space. Um, I'm excited to share um, as well, another cool space and another cool program. Uh, I'm gonna share today an overview about the Autodesk Technology Centers. Uh, to start, I thought I would just ground us all in who is Autodesk, who are we, what do we do? Um, just in case you haven't heard of us, um, but Autodesk is a software company. We work across a very cool set of industries. So from architecture, engineering, construction, to design and manufacturing, as well as media and entertainment. Uh, pretty cool. I would encourage you all to check out the suite of software that we provide. Um, and you may have used some of our tools before and not known it. Um, we're based here and uh, our headquarters are here in California in San Rafael. 
Uh, we have about 12,000 employees globally. Um, and I'll share these slides. I've included a couple things like our corporate fact sheet, as well as a TechCrunch article that kind of highlights the, the industries we support and some of our customers' projects and work. I'm now gonna dive into the technology centers and Autodesk's research organization. So the technology centers are rooted within the Autodesk research organization. And there are three main groups of research here at Autodesk. And it's kind of fun to think about them in terms of internally facing as well as externally facing and the spectrum of some of the work and research that is conducted. So to start with, the first group I wanna highlight is our um, science team. So our science teams tend to derive their own hypotheses and um, create papers, patents, and prototypes to explore their questions. Um, it's really internally facing or driven by some of our internal interests and internal work. The next layer is uh, our industry futures group, and they tend to partner and work alongside potential customers or customers and really explores, explore questions that need to be um, answered or projects in an applied fashion. And then lastly, we have what we refer to as our technology centers. And our technology centers, um, we do what we call open innovation, and we do that within our outside network. I'm gonna talk a lot today about the outside network, so don't worry, I'll give you more information. But just to give a quick highlight, uh, our outside network consists of external teams really focused on challenges that are facing um, industries today and innovation, some looking quite far out and some really focusing on current challenges and how to overcome those. Uh, so now I'm gonna kind of dive into more details about the outside network. And I'll give some examples uh, later on in the slide deck. Uh, but just to give you an example or an overview of who's in this outside network, what are some of these teams that make up? Um, it's a global community of resident teams that represent industry, academia, such as CCA, um, entrepreneurial sectors, so a lot of startups, especially here in San Francisco. And then we also have groups that we refer to as our network teams, which might be um, other innovation centers or incubators, accelerators. Sometimes we partner with other organizations. Um, for example, we might have a specific area of interest. So we might do a call for proposal. Right now we have one with Boston Dynamics and we're, we're working with their spot robot on automation on construction job sites. So that's an example of someone who's in our network um, teams. Startups, they love coming into our space because we have um, lots of cool equipment that I will highlight and show on a, the next few slides, um, as well as really great resources and collaboration amongst teams. Our academic groups such as CCA come in, it's a great environment to bump elbows with other um, innovators and subject matter experts, as well as um, global teams. So global connections across, um, across the globe. And then our industry partners, it's a great environment for research and development. They, um, they're able to leverage skills that maybe they don't have in-house from uh, residents or even internal Autodesk teams. So it's really a cool program, great network and great connections. We also have physical spaces, which I happen to be sitting in as well as the others here tonight. We are in Pier 9 here in San Francisco. Um, we have three main locations in North America. So San Francisco, Toronto, and Boston are where our um, physical locations reside. And within those locations, um, like I said, we have lots of equipment, which um, range from 3D printing and um, milling and um, additives, attractive robotics, uh, electronics labs, all kinds of cool equipment. But through that, we offer workshops and support. Um, we also have networking and collaboration um, as well. As an example, our workshop team often does trainings or support of our resident teams. Uh, you could come in as a resident team and have never touched a 3D printer before. It sounds like CCA has lots of um, opportunities for that, but um, if that is the case, we definitely provide that sort of support and workshop training, as well as other types of um, experiences to provide insight. For example, this morning, I attended one of our shop drop-ins that's hosted by our workshop team. 
it was on injection molding. And we had a guest from one of Autodesk's uh, Fusion 360 team. Uh, they sort of highlighted some of the features within Fusion 360 that support doing injection molding and simulations that might help detect errors prior to um, costly and sometimes damaging uh, uh, experiments with injection molding. So it was really fun, really exciting. We offer um, a variety of those types of experiences. But as well as that, we have fabrication um, and assembly space for folks. You can see we have nice desk environments and other amenities within all of these locations. Um, so I would encourage you um, all to, to take a look. We also have virtual tours, which I'm happy to share with folks so that you can sign up and do a virtual tour, tour of any one of the three locations that I've mentioned. We also have a community team and Gabby, who was mentioned earlier today, she's been instrumental in supporting experiences just like this one, but as well as others. So we might offer webinars, uh, panel discussions between residents, um, as well as like design critiques. So I think um, Jason mentioned, you know, that experience of the public and bringing in outside opinions and really getting feedback. We do that for residents, we help support that. And it's really exciting to see um, not only industries, um, but other um, across industry and cross um, cross teams collaborate. So yeah, we have we have a ton of experiences, and we're happy to share more. But just in summary, it's a global network, subject matter experts, lots of cool equipment, um, and it's a it's a free um, free program that is pretty exciting. I'm going to highlight very quickly some of the resident teams. This is a quote from one that. Um, home structures that really was excited about the connections they made within our network. But the first team that I want to highlight is Fologram. Fologram is based in Melbourne. They are an augmented reality solution um, provider working specifically in construction. And as you can see here, they are um, using the HoloLens for trades workers to see um, design plans, or in this case, um, yeah, design plans to help assemble uh, things on the job site and really support um, increasing skill and increasing time of completion and reducing cost. So pretty cool uh, technology that they've actually had the, uh, the privilege of, of applying and, and working with some of our other resident teams to try the, the technology out on real job sites. Um, pretty exciting. I've included in the slides some fact sheets. So when I send this out, you all can come back and learn more about each of the residents that I'm showcasing. Um, Apis Core is another one that sounds like it's pretty interesting and related to some of the work going on at CCA, but they're based in Boston, Massachusetts, and they develop solutions for additive manufacturing and construction. And as you can see here, they have some 3D printing concrete complex geometry without any formwork or support material. Uh, as part of their residency with us, they were able to connect with other subject matter experts and really um, develop a full-scale functional prototype of their movable site-based concrete uh, printing system. And they were able to make some connections with other resident teams to overcome some of the challenges they were facing with building codes in the United States. Pretty cool team, pretty cool concept. Um, and then lastly, I thought I would highlight our relationship with the California College of the Arts. So um, as was mentioned, uh, we have an academic alliance together and it's, it's very exciting for us. It builds upon um, the advanced design research that was highlighted just now by, by Jason with the Digital Craft Lab as well as the um, Architecture Ecology Lab. So I, um, I'm happy to share more, but I know we're tight on time. So I wanna pass it back to Key and um, I'm happy to include my email and we can talk more if anybody else is interested in uh, the technology centers. How'd I do on time? Thank you, perfect. Thank okay, you. Good. Um, yeah, thanks Angie. It's really great to hear all the different projects going on here. Um, so uh, next we have our, our more like keynote speakers. Um, uh, Guru Tice and Roxandra Chiakajadie. Oh my gosh, I'm sorry. Um, just say your name for us, um, your last name for us. Uh, but uh, Guru is a researcher at CETA and the Royal Danish Academy and ENSAD and PSL Paris, where she also assists teaching. Her research sits in the intersection of architecture, computation, digital fabrication, and microbiology. 
By modeling the 3D printing bioluminescence bacteria cultures, she investigates how architecture can be a host for an ecology of different species. Her hosts a master's, uh, holds a master's art, uh, of arts from the Danish, uh, the Royal Danish Academy, and her thesis explores the use of digital technologies to combine the traditional craft of metal sheet seaming and fabrication in contemporary architecture. In parallel, she studies programming in, at the University of Oslo. Alexandra is a researcher at CETA, the Royal Danish Academy. Her research focuses on digital modeling and fabrication across conventional and emerging materials. Specific uh, accent is placed on 3D printing in biocomposites and metal sheet forming using industrial robotics. She assists teaching the master's program uh, in the computation and architecture at the Royal Danish Academy. Alexandra holds a Bachelor of Arts from London Metropolitan University and a Master of Arts from the Royal Danish Academy. In practice, she has assisted architectural studios in both London and Copenhagen. Um, and please take it away. I'm really excited to hear what you have to say. Yes, thank you, Key. So my name is Roxandra Kirchda, just for like all the name butchering there, but no problem. <laughs> <laughs> and this is my guru, my guru, yeah, this is my colleague, Guru Tusim. Um, well, first of all, thank you so much for having us here. We're very excited to be able to travel here and run this uh, um, workshop with you and be able to be part of this panel and show us some of the work that CETA has been doing at the Royal Danish Academy as well as um, what, yeah, what we've been part of as well. Um, so yeah, maybe I'll just like share the screen and start. Okay, so can you guys see the screen? Yes, great. Yes. So um, just to begin with, I would like to give a um, brief introduction on CETA as we are both researchers there. Um, CETA, which is short for Center for Information Technology and Architecture, it is a research environment led by Mette Ramsgar Thonsen within the Royal Danish Academy, which explores the intersection between architecture and digital technologies. So CETA's investigation include a variety of fields from material processes, digital fabrication, um, data collection and machine learning, um, augmented reality sensing, behavioral data, and integration of these into feedback loops. So CETA explores several research areas, and we are currently researching an eco-metabolistic framework for sustainable architecture, which focuses on how to integrate biological and living elements in architecture. So we'll have a bit of focus on this. Uh, in this framework, renewable materials are investigated as an alternative path to current materials used in architecture. So this challenges the current construction paradigms, which are dependent on non-renewable non materials and accounts for 40% of the total CO2 footprint in the world um, and contributes to climate and material crisis. So even though these construction paradigm are actively being optimized, it is important to also think fundamentally new thoughts. So bio-based materials are renewable, they're biodegradable, they're abundant, inexpensive, and chemically versatile. We are working in these frameworks with uh, three themes. One of them is the harvested, which focuses on wood that already has a deep past of crafts. Um, another one is the composed. So here we're talking about biopolymers in which you can com basically compose the material and then you, you can tune it to achieve uh, different performances. And then the leaving. So here is the sphere of biodesign and we're going to talk about bioluminescent bacteria and um, idea of working with uh, biotechnology. Okay, so for the first part, which is the harvest, the, this is the project Roll Lamp which uses digital technologies to link across the value chain from forest to timber. And here the goal is to increase the amount of used timber, maximize its material potential, while also exploring new expressions for design and engineering. So using within our, in construction is an obvious first step towards reducing the carbon footprint of buildings, but in the industrial logics of timber production up to 70% of the input forest materials to buildings is lost because it is declared too low quality or cut or milled away in the process. So Roland proposes a workflow where the first step is to acquire data from the tree through CT scanning, and then use this to construct a three-dimensional representation of the tree and locally rate the material properties of the timber. 
then going into the design model of the glue laminated timber beam and then match local beam uh, requirements with the found timber qualities in the tree. So this workflow flow could in the future connect living trees in the forest to the sign of hyper optimized material use and actually producing something of high quality from also lower quality wood. So on the next theme, the compost. So here I mentioned that I'll be talking about biopolymers. There's a project predicting response. Uh, it's an ongoing research project at CETA that I've been part of. And it's in collaboration with the Department of Chemical Engineers at the Danish Technical University and machine learning experts from University of Reading. So this project speculates that machine learning can be used to develop new bio-based material practices for architecture, which is informed by material performance and further integrated in the fabrication process. Um, biomaterials bio are biopolymers, which are regenerative and biodegradable, but they also challenge us as they have an unpredictable behavior, as I'll show, and have a smaller lifespan. Um, as a fabrication method, we are interested in, in uh, 3D printing. So this is our setup here. It's an industrial robotic arm uh, with an extruder through which a slurry-based material is pushed through either with the help of a pump or air pressure. So our material is um, an in-house recipe developed uh, and then fine-tuned by um, the chemical uh, engineers at DTU. And again, it's an ongoing research on grading the material, but it's composed of a um, solvent medium, which is water, and it's the highest percentage, so that's like 72%. Uh, biopolymer, xanthan gum, which basically binds all the components together. Uh, plasticizer, glycerol, um, the structural uh, fibers, which is the cellulose. In our case, we're using paper flock from recycled newspapers and wood flour, which is a filler. So as I mentioned, the recipe is about 72% water and it presents two conditions, wet uh, when it's freshly mixed and printed with and dry after it undergoes a curing process. So in this curing process, the water evaporates. And when this happens, it starts to shrink and warp as you, can, you could see earlier in the video. And then another challenge uh, that we face with this material is the fact that it has a shorter lifespan than um, other materials that uh, um, we are used to. So our questions relate to understanding the material behavior and to scale up at an architectural level. So we have been looking into tracking the temporality between the wet and dry state using multiple sensors, such as camera, thermal camera, moisture sensor, in order to understand the also scale um, 3D scanning, um, motion tracking, in order to understand um, how does the geometry affect the curing and then the other way around. So in our um, sensing system, every five minutes within this tracking period, uh, data is being uploaded uh, on a cloud and then it informs a predictive, predictive model. Um, and then another exploration part of this project is the printing strategy for scale up. We noticed that uh, using an undulation-based toolpath provides a better stability. However, there is still collapse risk when a certain height is being reached um, because the material bulges under its own weight. So if we're limited in the Z height, in the Z axis, we are not, the only thing that limits us in the X and Y direction is the reach of the robotic arm and the printing setup. So we explore strategies for creating blocks for an assembly system. Um, in this case, we ask ourselves, how does a sample system with a biomaterial uh, blocks look like, considering also that they change behavior and how they can be designed across multiple scale from a demonstrative scale to a printing toolpath scale to a material scale, and how can the joints could be incorporated in the design language of the printing toolpath. We also try different um, fibers as well, since uh, um, this material, you can fine tune the recipe in a way that it gives you different performances. Um, representing the living material in this presentation. It is a project in collaboration with NSAID Lab, a research environment uh, at an art and design school in Paris. And I've been working on this project the past year at both locations. Um, so what we are doing is 3D printing micro architectures from a, an agar-agar based shell, quite similar to the media used in petri dishes in a proper microbiology lab. Uh, then we inoculate these structures with light emitting bacteria and these bacteria serve as a model organism to investigate how architecture can be a host for microorganisms, how this can perform as a living technology and what this co-living means in terms of environment 
control and caretaking. So understanding the living conditions of the bacteria is fundamental in our project. And the bacteria we use is Vibrio fischeri, and they live naturally in the ocean in symbiosis uh, with squid, where the squid really controls the light emitted by the bacteria by actually changing the environment of its light organ, where the bacteria live. So we are trying to build up a model to observe and understand. Um, so yeah, how we can use the host media to, uh, to design a sort of typology and steer. So um, we are using 3D printer to 3D printing to investigate how uh, typology and surface treatment can drive the light cycles and therefore the light performance of the bacteria. And this is our setup with, for production using a collaborative robotic arm with a Visotech micro dispenser and a heating unit for to ensure a good flow of the extrusion. And then sterilizing and incubating from biolab and as well as tracking this essential parts of the okay. Um, to evaluate our experiments, we use time lapses to see how the bacteria live and move and die in our architectures. And then, so we take a photo every 10 minutes and show them these like animations. Um, so, as the project asks what are the new technologies that are needed to design for and with the living materials, and one of those is a new way of representation, a tool that can draw in time and support dimensions, simulate the dynamics of the living organism and its dependencies on environmental factors. And this is the top view of a simulation we made to predict the life of bacteria in a given structure over time. So the left one is the actual results from photos and the right one is the simulation. Um, so this Simulation will enable us to explore and sketch the science without going through the whole process of fabrication and bacterial innovation to evaluate the designs. Okay, so this is a little jump over to computation architecture, which is in Austria, embedded in CITA. And uh, this is where me and Sandra graduated from soon two years ago. Um, and here your students get access to CETA's resources such as the robotic, uh, robotic lab, the bio lab, and the state of the art research knowledge. So the master is structured around project based experimentation and direct design engagement. So the teaching in computation architecture is divided in two. For the first part is the workshops, typically at the beginning of the semesters. And here the students are introduced to emerging research, usually from CETA projects. Like here you can recognize the syllabus printing from before. Um, and the focus is on the development of skills and methods. The other part of the program is the individual projects where students establish their own interests and are tutored by CETA researchers. And I will show some of the students' works here, uh, where the first one is using built material knowledge and CFT simulation to design a site specific membrane structure. Um, this is exploring the relation between manual and visual creation. Interacting directly with the tool path of a 3D printer to design a structure with specific characteristics. And here are 3D printing structures that these inhabit, but also continue to build the houses on. And working with mushrooms to purify toxic soil. Oh, guru. I muted you by accident. You should unmute. Okay. 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 <laughs> so it's also bridge into my and Sandra's current investigations at the Autodesk Technology Center in Austin. My thesis was centered around the connection I came up with for curved metal sheets, what I call the modulated team. And oh no. So, so the, the technique, technique takes the departure in the traditional standing seam, commonly seen in copper ripping all over copper made. And what, what I love about this technique is 
it is simplicity using the inherent properties of the metal to connect. It can be used for complex surfaces as well, but because it is labor intensive, it is not really relevant in the computer data modeling architecture. So this is my adaptation of the standing seam. Um, Crimping the seam, what I call modulating shrooms at the top, causing the panels to curve, and this is the connection rigidity and adds structural properties through the tensioning and curving of the sheets, as well as the seam itself becoming a kind of frame for the panel. Uh, and in addition to its practicality, the technique produces a strong visual effect through caustics and reflecting in the surroundings and becoming an ornament. So I developed a tool to automate the process of modulating these seams. And here the aim is both to rationalize for fabrication, but also to add precision and predictability to be able to design to fabricate. Um, and this is how uh, the tool made or the rolled one compared to the previously handmade by buyers. Um, by adjusting the gap in between the gears, the modulation and achieve radius can be changed. So through a lot of physical prototyping, I have been exploring the possibilities and the limits of the system, built up an intuition of what it can do, but to like in order to quantify this knowledge, to put it into a digital design environment and speed up the investigations, I made this test where I tried to push the material to its limit to see where it buckles and fails, and then 3D scan the result and compare it with the expected shape, and then analyze this to see where and why it fails. And then use this information to um, uh, as like, like design, design rules for a design, design proposal. That's, that's something we always, as NCTA, yet to have as an artificial uh, proposal. Um, here, the model also contains the information for fabrication, such as the panel cutting files and um, instructions for the tool. Yeah. Yep. So on that note, uh, we are now residents of the Data Technology Center in Moss, and then we continue to explore our interest on metal sheet fabrication. Um, our project called the Informer Scrap will explore design and fabrication methodologies to enable the reuse of scrap metal. Uh, so a bit of background on that, while a large percentage of scrap steel is recycled, much is still lost, and ends up in landfills. And, and even when, when steel is recycled, the energy consumption is very similar to virgin steel. So for this reason, we are looking into how to reuse steel sheets that have already had a life. So these are the looks of the materials we want to source, and we are targeting the household plants for now. And we are looking to integrate these aspects of the material, the rust, the dents, the bead rolls, into uh, our workflow. Uh, we, we intend, intend to build a demonstrator, and our methods are the modulated steam as an assembly method, and robotic human metal sheet forming on the result of curved surfaces for structural stability and design. So, uh, incremental sheet forming is a manipulative reform process for imparting 3D form onto thin metal sheets, and it moves a simple tool from either one or two sides causing the highly localized plastic deformation. Um, the the CITAD, there's been a lot of experiences with robotic and metal sheet forming in the past. However, uh, recently, um, there's also been an investigation on non flat sheets, reform for reuse, which is a project that I've been part of, and it's the basis for the incremental sheet forming for our research out at the Technology Center. So, this project is a lot of a case study of uh, looking into old drums as making urban furniture. furniture. And, and we have a work flow in which we register with this uh, information and we 3D scan them and integrate them in a digital workflow um, where uh, geometries are being placed, structural analysis are performed, and the uh, initial material conditions are being incorporated in order to get a final geometry. And in terms of fabrication, um, this is it's not as simple as forming on flat sheets. So, um, we investigated, it, for instance, another robot holding because of the buckling. So we investigated the possibility of having another robot with a holder tool to localize the forming of the, um, um, the forming process happening on the other side, or a rig with rigid spells that can be repositioned around the forming geometry. So this was the initial prototype from this project. And 
um, here, here like several, several of our uh, strategies can be used, and we're uh, looking forward to taking this together further into our project uh, resilience about the and so um, yeah, yeah, thank, thank you very much. much. Thank you two so much. And it was maybe just a little bit hard to hear you at some points, but hopefully we can tease out some more of the ideas. Not really sure what happened, but you were you were heard. But um, uh, next up, we have um, just our last presentation and then we'll move into the panel discussion. Um, so we have uh, Evan Jones and Margaret Akita. And um, so Evan Jones is an adjunct professor and Margaret Akita is an associate professor at the California College of the Arts in San Francisco. They teach in the architecture program and are co-directors of CCA's Architectural Ecologies Lab, along with Adam Marcus. They are founders of Assembly, a Berkeley-based architecture office with projects that span and scale from furniture to multi-story mixed-use housing. All right, and I'll, I'll see you all in the panel discussion after this. Thank you. Great, thank you. So I'm Evan Jones. And I'm Margaret. Thanks so much, Key for your introduction. And thanks Autodesk, um, Gabby and Sarah, particularly for helping us to move the venue uh, to Autodesk at Pier 9. It's been, um, it couldn't have happened without you both. So thanks very much. We're gonna do a very brief presentation. We're gonna cut short our presentation so we have more time for the panel discussion, but we wanted to give you a brief in introduction to the Architecture Ecologies Lab. Can you guys see this? It's not. You guys seeing the screen at all? Yes. You see the screen? The shared screen? Yes. Okay, great. great. Okay. All right. So you can go to the next slide. Evan and I, as uh, he mentioned, um, together with Adam Marcus, co direct the Architecture Ecologies Lab. The lab evolved out of the Boyne Ecologies work, which is a collaborative research platform that synthesizes architectural design, marine ecology, and material innovation to, ve to develop new approaches to constructing resilient waterfront structures. This work has ranged from speculative design work in the San Francisco Bay shown in yellow arrows, and implemented research projects shown in pink. In both cases, the work is informed by an incredible team of collaborators from cutting edge fabricators to marine biologists and other specialists in corporations such as Autodesk who have supported this work over the last seven years. It began with a simple insight about how floating architecture had the potential to rethink how we can design with and in support of underwater ecology. Traditionally, this, ecologi this ecological buildup is routinely scraped off boats. It's known as fouling. But if we think about the possibility of Cecil vessels, we can begin to think about optimizing this surface with contours or pockets that create an upside down reef. We began rather naively to explore contoured surfaces of various shapes to understand differential settlement which happened and to later investigate taller vertical columns of varying spaces where the colonization of animals resulted in what biologists called a sponge capable of dissipating wave action. So we're gonna show you um, a few research projects which build upon this in initial insight. The scaling up of contoured surfaces to create a floating research vessel that's been showed a, a couple times was with uh, Bill Chrysler, who helped us to think about how a single mold could be used to create two halves of a variable surface that could be designed to float and test experiments. The float lab was permitted, permitted and it wasn't an easy task and has been moored in the Port of Oakland for the last two years and has served as a platform to look at varying substrates and sensors. The float lab shown here has been a resource for both ongoing and new material approaches. It is designed to function singularly or as a cluster, and the way in which it can aggregate along the coastline could become a way to both promote healthy coastal ecologies, as well as protect the coast from erosion. The first experiments involved the suspension of vertical structures from the bottom of this with, through a series of racks. These have been monitored over the last few years. We looked at smooth and 3D printed surfaces printed from calcium carbonate by Alex Gofield. While there was initially 
a differential settlement of invertebrates, the accumulation of sequential settlements gravitated to an undifferentiated but very lush colonization. We next began to look at larger openings, thinking about the potential for more open structures. Going back to thinking about how the vertical structures could be rethought, we uh, rather than using fiberglass or resins, we looked to natural materials, specifically woven structures as a way of exploring differing shapes. As these became, as these shapes become inhabited, uh, what openings would remain um, to help shelter juvenile fish. So creating a suspended reef with minimal structure. And this work was done uh, through last fall's Constructed Ecologies elective. The students were given dogwood and willow branches, which were used by the native Ohlone for centuries for various traditional baskets and functional objects. The results were varied and each students were allowed to interpret and freely create different forms. This was the largest and already looks like a very good fish habitat. Uh, these were joined wine and like the float labs, speculatively thought of as an aggregation. Two months ago, these were deployed and are suspended below the float lab. We'll be going back to look at both the durability of the material and how the geometries conform in the recruitment of invertebrates and the habitat of small juvenile fish. This will begin to form how we can make the next iteration of strep substrates out of more durable biomaterials. And another exploration that Jason sort of touched on is natural materials that, have, uh, that um, is being explored in Adam Marcus's elective utilizing clay with a potter bot. And these will become the next experiments to be tested on the float lab. So another project uh, that we just want to share uh, related to habitats has been the culvert reef in the Presidio. Uh, and this project fits into a larger restoration work, uh, which is to daylight a creek in the Presidio. And it involves uh, about 10 years of removing hard surfaces and the reintroduction of native plantings through uh, which what's the largest uh, watershed in the park. And the creek, uh, this creek discharges into Chrissy Marsh. Uh, which was expanded under the new tunnel top projects which buried the 101 freeway. And while this new freeway section was elevated and splayed out to allow light for the new marsh, uh, Mason Street you see on the right was uh, unchanged and they needed a, they had a 60 foot new, 60 foot wide new culvert which needed to be created to allow for uh, a good flow of water. So we began by using some of our old uh, substrates as uh, just suspended under floating glass buoys within the existing marsh. And uh, while we waited for the culvert to be installed, created a bunch of new prototypes to see if we could recruit oysters within the marsh, because it wasn't clear that there were even oysters at all. But after about six to eight months, we were able to create, recruit many oysters, some of which grew quite large. And one plate had about 180 oysters. So during, uh, during the construction, we found out that the project was shifted from a pre-cast, cast-in-place culvert to a poured-in-place. Uh, and this allowed us to texture the sides, working within the parameters of the concrete budget. So we worked with the concrete uh, contractor to see what was possible for them to do. And they created mock-ups and uh, with various board and batten textures. And uh, we developed what is kind of essentially a two layer habitat on the one, uh, one on the wall and the rest with the, uh, these uh, new plates. These were developed with uh, CCA graduate, uh, Sean Cunningham, who became a resident also at the tech center. And we worked together to develop four variations of these modular structure surfaces with openings. And we created uh, 32 panels fabricated similarly to the float lab. And these were designed to have pockets to allow water to flow into and around the panel. Uh, and this is the location of the panels with the new marsh to the left and the existing marsh to the right. And the breach happened just over a year ago. And uh, here's the moment when the fresh and the salt water uh, mixed for the first time. And these, uh, these panels were deployed uh, last March. 
And although they're not publicly visible, we're working with methods of documenting the inhabitation, which involve creating GoPro frames where you can get numerical data about the settlement and hand counting of oysters. And this is kind of a quick rendering of kind of a fisheye view of how the panels work along this textured wall of the culvert. And you can see the increased surface area created um, in the spaces behind and in front of the panels. Each of these surfaces creates variable flows. And so we're looking into how this affects the recruitment of native oysters and other species. The panels can get repositioned, relocated, and clustered to study the effects on new oyster settlements and serve as a new model to how we think about restoration work with digitally designed surfaces. Although the recruitment of oysters may seem a little like a myopic kind of investigation, the culvert can serve as an accessible location to test how we can modify and improve ecological performance on all new infrastructure projects of this type. The San Francisco seawall is scheduled to be replaced. And the risk to the city from storm surges and seismic events has been estimated to be $30 billion. So how can we think, begin to think about integration of habitats that can benefit both human and the non-human? And that's something that this type of research can help demonstrate. Okay, so I'm going to um, bring back to Key and Key is with the panel and we'll start the panel discussion. And if you have any questions during the panel discussion, just please put it in the chat. Hey, hello. Hello, welcome. Yeah, welcome. Um, we're here now in the arcade of Autodesk all together for our panel discussion. And um, I just wanted to kind of start off by asking um, maybe each one of you, um, where, um, how did you kind of get your start um, and, and get to, you know, get to where you are today? Big question. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I think for me, it started when I was uh, in bachelor's architecture and working in CAD and just thinking all the time like, oh, I want this to be kind of changeable or parametric. And then uh, in my, after my bachelor's, I tried some uh, programming and I really liked the logics of it. And then I, coming into CETA, I've started to use that logic for, um, uh, for interesting projects. And what I think is really cool is that I've, I've sort of learned a, method or the skills in CETA that suddenly I could be employed to work with bacteria, even though I've never, <laughs> never worked with bacteria before. So that's, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I think given the uh, same for me in bachelor's, I've um, uh, followed more like the traditional. Uh, so it's very much building design and I was very interested in trying something new and I wasn't expecting that um, what digital craft has to offer and generally computational design can be so wide. So I was actually expecting to be just model based. But when I uh, came to computation in architecture, I realized there's so much more to it. And I got very, very interested in materials. And I mean, I had an interest in materials from before, but this time the fact that I can design them in a certain way, create a relationship between the fabrication method, the designer, myself and the material uh, was very interesting for me and further um, exploring like current now biomaterials in CETA projects. It uh, was really interesting to see that I could actually change some ingredients and they get certain performances. Um, I still am trying to figure out what I want to be when I grow up. So, <laughs> I, um, I started out as a, a computer engineering student who wanted to do art and it wasn't necessarily a pathway that was outlined at the school that I went to. So, um, I also had struggles with like imposter syndrome in engineering. And I think that's what drew me to education because that was an environment where I felt like I could have an impact on others who are pursuing their dreams and their interests and where things collide that we don't, we don't expect like biology or, um, so yeah, I'm still, I'm still working on it, but, um, I just, uh, I like to connect with lots of people and continue to explore like new technologies. I'm just, I'm definitely into technology that, that I, 
I, I've gotten pretty clear on. I think it's a great question. Um, and one of the things that was sort of for, formational for me um, was learning um, processes, not through architecture or art, but actually through music. And um, um, maybe 15 years ago, getting involved with some folks that were musicians that were making custom musical instruments. Um, this is actually at the University of Virginia um, and kind of collaborating with them on, on with some students on, on things that I was thinking were architectural models or architectural or spatial things. And then the musicians were, they were performative things. Um, and so just from the very beginning, thinking about, um, you know, the process of kind of customizing, you know, tools and, and beginning to think of things in a performative manner, for me, was really the, the foundation of a lot of the work and like seeing how architecture could be hackable and could be about performance. Um, and I think, um, yeah, to this day, that that kind of spirit is a part of the a part of the lab. And um, the other thing that I think has become really important is just this idea of not so much just being a user of technology, um, but but you know um, trying to fundamentally think of ourselves as creators within that. And so, what part of this you know process when you have all these amazing, expensive, fancy machines? Do you have agency? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, that's why I think there's a lot of um, allied interest between um, CETA and, and CCA, as an example, um, where you guys do have access to incredible technology, right? But you're doing, you're using it in kind of really critical ways. And sometimes it's really low tech and sometimes it's really high tech. And there's this kind of, and sometimes it's like super low tech, mm -hmm. right? And there is like, questionable if you call it technology on some level right and i love the i love the interplay of those two worlds and i think some of the most interesting work is is happening you know within within this field at that kind of domain mm -hmm. yeah i guess that kind of makes me think of like how um like work can be informed by both like the technologies and the materials and kind of you're saying like low tech versus high tech and kind of like you're you know you are dealing with like more molecular and like hand tools and then also like use um, found objects. So like how, do you, like how much back and forth and like interplay between like creating and like learning and working with these technologies is kind of um, uh, like, are, do you have a goal and then kind of set out for the goal or is, are, is your process kind of informed from materials or informed from the procedure, the technology? Um, and yeah, is there a specific thing that comes to mind? Um, yeah, I think I can start a bit on that. Like, I can just maybe give a bit of more uh, personal example that I've been exploring as a student, and I think it kind of goes on, moves on further on. Like, even in our project as well as a residency, is just to like start with like a small question and then a certain exploration about a material or so, and then um, try to create a goal from it and see where we can achieve. But I think there's also room for flexibility here because you never know what you can, what other opportunities you may open when uh, uh, working with this. So maybe I'll just like talk a bit about our example for the simming tool that Guru has. Well, like I really appreciate about it is the fact that she just started like in a very manual way and just working with flyers. Uh, and then created this tool and then it further filled mm -hmm. it into a whole like digital workflow and um, relationship between like the, the digital model and the physical uh, um, yeah, process. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, it's quite nice the fact that what Jason mentioned as well, like having low tech, high tech is the fact that if you start in terms of like now um, material processes, if you start with quite low tech and quite very handmade tools, and even if you just start with some pliers or like a bid roller or um, some certain now specific example sheet for um, metal sheets you know with some sort of a forming tool and then uh, upgrading it to a digital workflow I think that's quite something that is in my interest for instance and I think that's something that has been part of my workflow anyone else um yeah so I guess like um I guess thinking about like material process and like sustainability like are there like specific um I would say like um, things that are engaging with um, like the future of, you know, climate change and all that. And like with sustainable materials, like, do you have like, um, you know, like things that are, are um, more like difficult or are like you can see as like a positive light for like how these, these different technologies are gonna like help or hinder us? I can 
get the <laughs> big one yeah um so i guess it's a bit of both i think the technology can definitely make uh fabrication of new material easier but in the same time new materials provide um, a lot of new challenges. So for instance, in the realm of biomaterials is that, um, yeah, we can use 3D printing and tune the recipe and create this relationship between um, uh, 3D printable uh, material composed of several ingredients that then um, can you can extrude with or you can mold it or you can like kind of craft your digital your fabrication um, set up according to that material. So there needs to be a relationship between the two. Um, which I think it can be scaled up as well. So if we're looking again, example of 3D printing, there are now a lot of like 3D printing concrete houses. So uh, from what additive manufacturing was before to where it reached now, it's um, uh, evolved. And I think there is space and time for this to evolve as well, in, uh, like introducing um, composite materials or maybe even um, some, I don't know, if it's smaller scale, like what's happening in, bi in uh, biology labs, you know, like our relationship between architecture and biology. But in the same time, uh, we're talking about materials that degrade much quicker and then raises the question of temporality because it has a much lower lifespan than what we are used to and what our buildings are built from now. So how it, what, what is the application of them and how we can work with the scale and the temporality of the new materials there are now um, in that have actually high interest across uh, like a global interest. I would also say that maybe in the past technology in the sense of industrialization and standardization has helped a lot in optimizing processes, but it's removed something from a traditional craft, like for instance, taking this uh, Roland project where in like thousands of years, you have been looking at a, a tree and you know, using the actual um, material properties to what it is designed to be. And also, you know, you cut different um, planks of the wood and then you use the different pieces for different things. And in standardization, like we talked about, it's rather, it's like too low quality or it's enough and everything is the same. And I think bringing technology into this again with the scanning and the um, digital tools, we can also benefit from these traditional crafts. So taking that back. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I was just going to add that we see quite a few residents who focus on sustainability of materials and design and how to augment some of these challenges that you you are bringing up, like these tensions of mm -hmm. new domains that we're ex exploring, but also the new challenges that come with those. So um, it's definitely fun to see the the research and the work that's going into sustainability. Um, and that's, that's a big focus for Autodesk and some of our tools even um, have built in features to help designers and um, engineers look at things like material sustainability. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was gonna say, it's really fascinating to see um, some of the stimulation softwares that you guys are using. Um, and you can imagine, you know, having the capacity to, to simulate material degradation. And so you actually understand within a material, which parts might fail you know, earlier than other parts. And so you can build that into maintenance or replacement, you know, protocols. So there might be parts of buildings. I mean, it's very similar to buildings now. There's certain parts of buildings, right, that you know you, you're going to have to replace every 20 years or 30 years. And there's other parts that are very much going to last for hundreds of years on some, some level. Um, and so it was really intriguing to just see some of the, like, scanning technologies combined with sensing combined with simulation mm -hmm. um, and you guys are trying to figure out that that holy grail that kind of workflow right um so it's really exciting to see yeah if um if i can just add something to that because i think it was quite interesting that you mentioned the fact that this is happening every like 20 30 years like we're still looking at the buildings around us and again it's like a compare with older materials that we've been used to actually that already had a long time of being developed and we know how to use them um, the maintenance strategies compare with how would new materials be maintained now, uh, like would it would them require to be more often and what would, what would them be, what would they be? Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's, I mean, that's super interesting. I, I guess like a lot of the times it's like, we think of all these like technologies being super far out and we're like, oh, we're, you know, in the future, you know, we're going to solve it. And all of these, um, these like technologies are, you know, so far out, but um, just like coming from your experience and, you know, your work and other work you've, you know, heard of experienced is, is there like some technology that's, 
you know, more like in the present, but like feels maybe more futuristic? Or is this like, is this some of like the, you um, you were showing the the goggles or the actual like scanning of, of laying brick. And is there like certain technologies that are like super exciting for you that are happening right now that are gonna be able to be scaled up um, sooner than later? Jason? I don't know. I, I, <laughs> Jason, <let's, laughs> there's a lot happening in, in medical fields. Um, you know, and maybe there's something positive out of all these people in the labs trying to figure out viruses. And I don't know, I had in my head that, you know, maybe some of this would be channeled towards new materials and new technologies, new methods. I, I don't know. Um, but, you know, for sure within the biosciences, there's so much happening um, that you can imagine. Um, well, you're, you're already seeing it, like some of the stuff that you're showing, but you can really imagine that as a really incredible emerging field, right? Um, um, within architecture, landscape architecture. Um, so that for me is really exciting. It's exciting to see that you're trying it, you're doing it, you know, you're involved in it. Um, Get a new career ahead of us. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I agree. And for, um, I believe that, for instance, for this new materials that we're talking about, bi biocomposites, for instance, we still have a lot to understand before um, we maybe print at the same scale, 3D print at the same scale that we're 3D printing with concrete now, you know. Um, but on the other hand, looking at our project now of Empower Scrap and reusing metal sheets, like this is another, well, another way of tackling the sustainability problem, not through uh, using uh, composites out of uh, biopolymers and biodegradable materials, but actually tackling the waste problems. Mm -hmm. So for instance, we are now targeting um, metal sheets from landfill in order to introduce them in architecture. So I think that's something that maybe happens a bit more sooner than later. And I would just add um, the comment about the AR and augmented reality and virtual reality. Um, and with my background in gaming, that's that's where my brain goes, is just um, so much work in architecture and design is already being done in a three-dimensional virtual environment. And so the, the jump to a virtual reality um, is not that big of a jump right now or anymore, uh, even with things like the metaverse and um, some of the newer uh, technologies that are coming out. But the example that I showed earlier is today, right? Mm -hmm. Like how can we augment um, things that maybe used to be on paper or used to be um, a much less digital workflow with technologies like XR. Um, and this actually relates really well to a question that we've got um, from outside um, from the chat. Um, oh, oh. <laughs> uh, so we have the outside's coming in. Um, so David Rico Gomez um, would like to ask, how do we reckon with the high barrier of entry to larger digital craft or biodesign project research? How can this work become accessible outside of the lab? Yeah, that is a really good question. That is a really good question that we've also been uh, talking about. And I think it really depends on the scale of the material that you use. So, um, for instance, if you use some, um, like now make, making a bit of a contrast between uh, um, Biolum, that the project that has been, the, what girls been working on at CETA and the project instrument I've been working on is the fact that we use completely kind of different composites that allowed to either increase in scale or reduce in scale. So this kind of, um, either makes that step larger or bigger, but um, I think in order to get away from that, um, in like for instance, what the recipe that we developed the predicting response, you really need to, you could scale up according with like a larger extruder, larger printer, and then you probably could work with fab labs and uh, try to, to scale that up. But there are also other problems that need to be understand before that, such as the shrinkage behavior. Like for instance, if it's wet for too long, it starts to mold. Mm -hmm. So uh, it can be bioccupied, you know? So there's a lot of like question towards that, even like us, how do we perceive that? At some point, maybe we have a panel of uh, like a biocomposite material that it's outside and then it starts to mold and be occupied by uh, living organisms. And that that's sitting next to our window. So how, how can we perceive that? So mm -hmm. it's not, I don't think it's necessarily a step beyond technology, but even for us, you know, as people, how do we perceive something that degrades so fast against something that is more stable, like a brick wall? Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I think there's a different step from uh, taking everything from a biology lab, like for instance, um, uh, working with mycelium or like uh, other like living bacteria on how, um, there, there's a lot of investment there as well if you need to sterilize, if you need to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's actually really tricky with it. That's one of my big questions as well. How do you 
this microbiology and working in biolabs, the rules are so strict. Mm -hmm. You know, everything has to be sterilized and the amounts of plastic used, like you can take one drop and then you throw a, or mm -hmm. out a plastic syringe part. And it's, it's not very accessible at all. Um, and also, and for good reason, I, like you should handle bacteria with care. But how do you make this more accessible? But there, I, I would say that this project actually has taken a lot from the maker movement. And this recipe for the 3D printing started by just Googling like bioplastics or something mm -hmm. and finding that, as well as these bacteria, if just a, I think he's a bio biologist in Germany, who's just has taken them out of the, uh, of a fish, he just mm -hmm. bought a fish, mm -hmm. fish to fish or something, and then he isolated it himself, and now he can buy it for. So I think it's there, but it's also tricky. Yeah, what what I cannot add. What I think is interesting is that this is not necessarily when working with bacteria or mycelium. Like you don't necessarily need to think about the occupation of people and how it affects people, but other or living organisms around us. So what you're making, where where you can design, is also kind of habitats for like other uh, organisms. And how we can kind of collive, I guess, would be a question for the future as well. Mm -hmm. I was going to say that um, we had at the Digital Craft Lab at CCA a forum where we had um, someone named Phil Bross um, give a talk a few years back. And he's one of the first people 20 years ago working with mycelium and making bricks. Um, so, it's, you know, really groundbreaking work. And what's incredible with that early work of his is that there's, there's a, um, he left a trail of inspiring um, recipes and research um, that was sort of open sourced. And you can go to Instructables and all these lots of places and actually find citizen scientist recipes and other things for mycelium. Um, and you can see it now, there's lots of people researching mycelium. There's been several projects built with it. But, you know, in a way, I mean, to the question that was asked, um, you sort of just jump in, you know, at, a, at an entry point. Um, and don't be afraid, uh, you know, you, you might not have access to UCSF's biolab, you know, right off the bat, you know, but there are, there are sort of lower, um, you know, tiers that you can just jump into that could really start to, um, you know, launch a kind of research project, let's say, without like a huge lab uh, to, to have the, you know, do it safely, you know, yeah. all of that stuff, but yeah. you know, it's, it is possible. So oh, but definitely like in Sita, we started with just a pressure cooker and like all kitchen appliances. And then we had to take our fridge and say no food in this fridge. That's, <laughs> that's where we were. And then we've started to build this bio lab and we learn more and more about it. Yeah. Well, I feel like that actually really ties in with our last question of the night. And this is also from out there um, from Lucas Carreño. Um, and this is for Guru and Roxandra. Um, how did you come up with your research topics and was it a random realization or a series of different research that led you to where you are today? So you kind of answered that, but maybe you can. Yeah, I mean, first of all, the project that we presented are CETA projects that, I mean, the ones of like predicting response and biolum and uh, then our, um, I've also been working in my thesis project with um, uh, 3D printing of cellulose based composites. So I've also had a big interest on that, but also taking from the CETA project introductions. Um, and uh, then for the metal sheets forming, I think uh, we both, like I also uh, did some um, uh, metal forming in my fourth year, but obviously looking at background and what can be done. And uh, now we have our common interest of bringing our forces together in assembly <laughs> and forming. And uh, um, yeah, I guess this like, the background had quite an impact on our interest, I mean, at least my interests at the moment. Yeah, I think for me, what I've slowly been starting to realize is that I, I love to work with material and then metal sheets is really accessible to start with because you can cut it with a knife and you can, you know, just fold it around and then you can, metal is really scalable. So you can say just like, this can be scaled up and, uh, um, yeah, and then I think like the digital model um, methods have just come uh, naturally into that. Yeah. Great. Great. Thank you so much. So um, thank you all. This was really fantastic. It's so great to see the range of work, the synergies between the work, get on camera. But um, I also want to speak to our, our guest. Um, to see the home team, uh, Jason, the Digital Craft Lab, Margaret and Evan with the Architectural Ecologies Lab, Adam moving between those who couldn't be here with us tonight. 
Angie from Autodesk. I mean, it's just a thrill to really now for the first time be digging into the alliance that Margaret and Nagar um, really just initiated and, and drove forward. Um, Rexandro and Guru, like the work is phenomenal. I'm so excited to see what you do with our students on Saturday, um, what you talk about them with tomorrow. I know you're having a seminar over here at the Technology Center. Key, like one of our first residents through the Alliance, really, like the work that you're doing with Nagar. It's just super exciting. I want to thank everyone for coming out. A last big push for the Academic Alliance. If you're interested in what we're doing, you can find us at cca.edu. You can find out about it at the Autodesk website. Um, and go look at all the amazing work that CETA is doing as well. So thanks, everyone. Good night, everyone. Thank you. 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 Thank you.